What's happening, guys? There's a lot of shit going on in the Gate 7 and international world this weekend, and we are pumped to talk to you about it. I'm joined here by Marcial and Costa. These are the most we've had in, uh, in a live in a little bit. How are you boys doing today? Fine, fine, fine. I hope you're all doing fine, too. Costa? Greetings from Kanyakri. Good to be back. In the motherland. Jealous, jealous, jealous. Boys and girls, we've got a show for you today. We will be opening the lines up uh, shortly. We've got a little bit of housekeeping, some announcements for you guys as well that we need to talk about. But before we get into all of that, those of you that are watching, looks like there's about 30 of you in here already in the first couple seconds of the show. Uh, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button if you haven't already. This helps us continue to grow the community. There are big things happening here. Big things are happening. You've seen it on socials. We're going to talk about it. Help more people find us. Help us grow the red and white net. This is the community that's open to everybody across the globe. Subtitles in Greek, Spanish, French, whatever language you need them in, they are available for all of our pre recorded content and the live shows. Subtitles are available within 24 hours after the show. We are working on live subtitles, which is something hopefully Patreon will help us achieve. But there's a lot of things we're working on, and we're excited to talk about that. Speaking of Patreon, boys and girls, Patreon went live literally two days ago, I think. And uh, some of you guys have already hopped on board. Support us on Patreon. A bunch of you asked us about supporting us over the last couple of years, almost three years now. Our third year birthday is coming up. Here's your chance to do so. We're, we were always uncomfortable asking you guys for contributions if we didn't have something to give back. Some of you donated us to us already on YouTube. We thank you for that 100%. I'm going to be reaching out to some of the people that donated on YouTube already. And this is now our way we can give back to you. So there's three tiers for Patreon. A dollar a month gets you entrance into our exclusive WhatsApp group where you can get a quick look at early data, early information before things we publish on socials. Uh, everybody that joins, we shout you out on the website. You're, you're going to be in a list on the website and a page as a contributor, as a patron, and of course on the live show. Speaking of, thank you to our first patrons that we have the information for. Uh, at Christos Moore on Twitter, uh, Christos Moraitis on Moraitis One on Instagram, at Thrilos New Jersey on Twitter, and at Tagaras007 on Twitter. Thank you guys for being the first patrons of the show. Like I said, there's more of you that have told me you are going to be in Patreon. Once you finish the process, I'll get you on here. And I think we're still waiting for a couple of people to share their social information. So thank you guys. Um, I, there's also two more tiers besides the $1 tier. There's a $5 a month tier, which gets you at least two extra episodes a month. Those two extra episodes will be things, extra episodes that will not take away from our Libyakos content. Things like interviews outside of the realm of Libyakos and extra analysis, extra in-depth game analysis. Uh, things like that, plus more ideas are going to come. And people in the $5 a month tier will get early access to the deep dives before the, the player gets announced. Because we've been publishing them right around when the players get announced. You'll get to see that beforehand. And you'll get early access to interviews. Then lastly, the final tier is the $10 a month merchandise tier. We have pre-selected a piece of merchandise, which I'm still finishing the agreements for, uh, that you will get as part of that tier. Moving forward, starting from next year, we're hoping to be able to give you a choice of what type of merchandise you would like to select. So those are the three tiers right now for Patreon. If you want to support and help us continue to evolve what we offer you in terms of content, please support us. Every piece of support is extremely important to us. So thank you all. Thank you to our first patrons. And thank you to those who are going to become patrons. Uh, another piece of information, boys and girls, earlier before the show, we saw the new forward for Libyakos, Ayub El Kabi. The scouting report is live. So if you want to check out, learn a little bit more about the player, you can do so now. You can check it out on YouTube. Um, the... Uh, there's been a lot of media attention about this player, and we discuss whether or not he really is the next Yusef El Arabi. So check it out, and if you have any questions, you can always reach out to us on social media. Uh, we will be doing, uh, I believe, Costa, correct me if I'm wrong, a pre-match 
for the Europa League match against Genk with the Belgian Football Podcast. Uh, I believe we're still scheduling that. Costa, is that is that still happening? If we manage to align the schedules, hopefully, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Always, hopefully, yes. yes. So hopefully we can get a nice pre-match with the Belgian Football Podcast for you. Uh, we're pretty excited about working with them. Uh, I think we've had them on the show before, have we not, yep. with Antwerp? Yeah we, yeah, we talked to them yeah, before Antwerp. That's right, and I remember that being a pretty good show. Um, uh, another another quick housekeeping item for you guys before we get moving. Wildfire fundraisers. For those of you that are outside of Greece, maybe, and you want to help with the support for the, the repairs of the damage that have been called by the wildfires or the assistance in the support of the wildfires, AHEPA, the American... Hellenic Educational Progressive Association is hosting multiple fundraisers to provide wildfire elite wildfire relief for Greece. We are hosting a fundraiser here in Maryland. So if any of you are in the Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, Pennsylvania area, this coming Saturday, there will be a huge fundraising event. Uh, it is we're going to I will probably share it on our socials for anyone that's in the area. And Ahepa is also doing a merchandise drive. All proceeds are going to go for wildfire relief. I have a partners with multiple emergency service uh, uh, organizations, I guess I'll call them departments that are in Greece. The money goes directly to them to hire people, to get more help, to assist for wildfire relief. And we also provide money for families that have been affected by the wildfire. So if you are interested in providing wildfire relief, please let us know. Check out the merchandise drive, which we will share on our socials. And... Guys, I'm going to drop the link soon. Check out the chat. We're going to drop the link soon so you guys can join us. And if anybody wants to come live, don't feel like you have to. But if you want to, uh, then we can you know, have a little chat about things. But without further ado, let's get started. And there's been quite a few things going on before we get into the Europa League stuff. Departures, rumors. The big one, Oleg. Waiting for the announcement from Russia. It's six million in cash plus an extra million and a half, I believe, in bonuses. But all of this is going to be added to the transfer budget so that we can continue to sign some players. And Oleg is out. Anybody have any feelings about that? Costa, Mar uh, we do have a lot of feelings about that. I feel. Uh, first of all, it's good news to make a, a sale like that. Uh, right. We've been waiting for sales like that since I don't remember uh, the last sale we've made that is up to five million. I was wondering that before going to the show, but Miralas. Uh, yeah, Miralas. It's, it's yeah. years ago. Like it's yeah. a very long time ago, uh, and also it's the timing looks good to me. Uh, the last season was probably enough for like probably make the season too much. I don't know the word exactly, but it stayed too much. He needed to leave. It ended up quite badly, I would say, because he had to leave the mission in Scotland. But I'm happy for him because like whole parts seems to be happy about that move. And that's something that is very rare with Olympiacos. Costa. It's a weird one because, I mean, he he had the bad luck that he's coming, he's coming into Olympiacos at the time right after Timikas left. So from the beginning, it's like, okay, who's the Timikas replacement? And you bring this guy in. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, he was actually a January transfer, wasn't he? So it was who was who was playing left back? Holebas, I guess. Holebas was, was that was, that third season of Martins. That's he was right. supposed to be so, rotation and he was starter. Yeah. So, you know, he had that bad luck coming in and he was, I think, labelled wrongly by, by a part of the fan base. But, you know, you look at it, you look at it the last few weeks and how the story developed. It's, it, I, I said it's a strange one because about, about a month ago, the media were reporting that he didn't want to go to, to Russia because of his family ties to Ukraine. <laughs> and then, you know, two weeks later, he gets kicked out of training during the UK tour. He's sent back because he's been talking to Spartak and because he's allegedly agreed with them. So, you know, that whole, you know, going from a position where I'm not going to Russia because 
family issues, etc. To I'm going to Russia, they're offering me two million euro. It, you know, at, at the end of the day, though, it's, it's as it's as Martial mentioned. It's a good deal for the player. It's a good deal for the club. I, you know, it's hard to remember the last time we made so, so much money from a transfer. So that's good. Uh, and you know, I don't think many Olympiagos fans will be too. I don't mean this disrespectfully, but you you read the fan base doesn't seem like a lot of Olympiagos fans are really going to miss him that much. Personally, I I appreciate what he gave to the club. He never uh, he never faked. You know, he he gave everything that he could in, in every game. I think he was burnt out after a, after a while as well. He was overused. He had no. You know whether it was because Pedro Martins didn't like Leo Cutres or or whatever reason. You know he played a lot of games uh, for yeah. for the club, and we'll remember him for the goal against Antwerp, the assist to Tiquinho against Fener, and uh, and for um, you know killing Banathanaikos' title hopes last season with with the win at home. So you know best of luck to him moving on. And uh, well, that's pretty much all I have to say about Oleg. Yep. He did. We didn't have too many injury issues with him. He was there day in, day out, regardless what you have to say about his skill. Maybe he was a soldier for the club. So yeah. uh, that's what, at the very least, you can say that about him. And we got a lot more money than I ever expected. So uh, imagine pretty... like you, you leave the club uh, with a, a, a late goal against Panathinaikos as a legacy. There you go. There you go. For a, for a defender, I mean, I think it kind of erased the 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 past months he had done on the field because I don't know. It's a goal we will remember for sure. The Ramon enthusiasts are here checking in. No, no Lambro guys. So the Ramon chat, <laughs> the Ramon chat isn't gonna can, get can, anybody can I super just, upset. Can I just say, like, just. This isn't even like for shits and giggles, but how shit is Ramon? <laughs> I'm, just, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but like he's a foreign player too. He's taking up a foreign spot right now. Um, yeah, sorry, just because I wasn't on the last show when you were having those giggles about him. But anyway, rumors about a left back coming in. That's true. And we're going to get to the rumors of transfers coming in, but there's one more outgoing to cover, and that's Agibu Kamara. Looks like Agibu is going to be going on loan again to Atromitos. He, we had an offer from Charleroi. Am I pronouncing that correctly in Belgium? Charleroi. 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 Oh, my goodness. My French accent is horrible. Martial, you got to help me out here. Uh, but we said no to an offer from Charleroi for him and it looks like we had multiple offers from other french teams as well that were interested but he is going to be staying in greece and going to atromidos cannot say i'm surprised he's going out on loan uh i did mention personally a couple times on the show although his defensive characteristics like in that mid block i could see being useful i didn't see how he could be in a team that's looking to move possession and move the ball quickly it's unfortunate. It is what it is. It's one of those cases. This is a young player. At one point, he was the next big thing coming out of our club, and now he's been on loan for a season and a half straight. So, unfortunate. It's an unfortunate case, and I really hope that we can make something can happen with this player, or at the very least, we can find a club where he can restart his career, get a fee or a sell-on from him, because it's just a shame. How do you both feel about this? Uh, we'll start with Costa this time. I think from the moment that we've signed Alexandropoulos, uh, it's kind of you know all over for him because I think they have some some similar traits in terms of the ability to press high up the field. They're both fairly low center of gravity. Well, hang on, no, I might be wrong about that. Excuse me, Alexandropoulos is one meter eighty six. If I read the stats correctly, I couldn't believe it actually when I read that. Neither could he, I. So when you see him on the pitch, or at least from the TV. He doesn't look that big, but nope. okay, he's he's 21, 22 years old now. Maybe he had a growth spurt the last couple of years. I have no idea, but um, they have similar traits. So I think the fact that they they bring in a Greek player on loan with a view to a permanent transfer, you know, I think that didn't bode well for him. I also thought the fact that he was away at Afcon and you know 
missing uh, missing a significant part of the preseason training wasn't that wasn't great for him. Um, but you know when we did when we did the coach analysis when when Martinez was announced, you know I think you and I were talking about who are the players that that are out of favour or coming back from loan that could actually have an opportunity under the new coach and and he was one of them. But the truth is there are just too many players in that yep. position right now. Um, not to mention, you know, players like Kunde that, that aren't even training with the first team. You've got Madi Kamara, we don't know what's happening with him. Uh, Bukhalagis is still around. Uh, Imbom Huang, Alexandropoulos just coming in as well. Ibora. And I always fancied him as more of an eight, like as a box-to-box player. And yeah. In the Norwich game, he was playing like a like a 10, kind of 8 slash 10 in that midfield. And as soon as I saw him like playing further forward, I thought, no, nah, it's not. I don't, I don't consider him in that position. I think Carvalho for me is ahead of him. Yes. Yeah, right now. So, okay. I understand he had a lot of offers outside Greece. And I think you alluded to it. In, in your introductory comments, the issue is what happens with him in terms of potential profit, uh, because I think his contract runs out 26, uh, if I'm correct. So 25, uh, sorry, uh, 25. Yeah, 25. I would say, so, yeah, 25. So he'll come back in the summer and then he'll have a year left on his contract. So what do you do with him? Right. And how willing is he to renew if he gets back into the team. So I think you hit the nail on the head too, man. Like it's a, prof, a player that came in with, with um, high hopes, let's say, and then just you know, he's ended up being shipped off to Atromitos last yeah. season and, and this season. So yeah, bit of a weird one. Yeah, it is. But at the same time, like in the friendly, he also, with what I have seen from Diego Martinez's teams and what we've seen, in the transition of the friendlies, right, of how we've played as a team, right? He doesn't move the ball fast enough, to me, to be somebody that he wants in his team. We're seeing our our match tempo, even in the games we've played badly under Diego Martinez, our match tempo has increased almost double what it was last season. And that's just in these friendlies, like very noticeable changes with how we move the ball around. And that's been something he said he was focusing on on the friendlies. And my one thing was all... <clears throat> even though I thought that Agibu's nature and his ability to intercept the ball and make uh, opportunities for us on the counter or just by being able to win possession and being somebody that's very good in that type of play, he doesn't move the ball in open play as fast or as technically as I think players Diego Martinez is currently bringing in can do that. Like Alexandropoulos, even though he probably dribbles the ball a little bit too much in the midfield, much like a Fadiga or a Dabo currently. He is good when he does do one, two pass and move. He's actually, every moment I've seen him do it, he's, he's pretty good at it. It's just, can we get him to not want to hold the ball too long? Or on the other side, Agi Bukamara, who when he does do one, two touch pass and move, he can misplace the ball. Errant passes within the five, 10 meter mark. Those are, those are things that, I foresaw as the reason be- for him not being used. Um, that's just something I saw. And there's a comment here from Andreas Mitzis, big disappointment that Agibu might meet the same fate as Olaitan, even if Olaitan decline was due to health problems, of course. However, Adrenobinos has brought players to life before. Yeah, two completely different, um, two completely different situations there, but I do see what you're saying. Uh, Marcial, any more on the Agibu situation? Well, I don't really understand how the club handled Agibu because the first season when he came, I have to remind you that it was his first professional season. Like he has ups and downs, very high ups for me, like the game in Turkey against Fenerbahce, for example. Mm-hmm. And of course, when you have that first season, you have to you, you had to play uh, on the wing too. But the, the last season, it was a waste. Like, just remind, just remember the number of players that have played in the midfield for Olympiacos during the season. 
Right? You had Kasami, not needed. Kunde, right. not really needed in my in my opinion. Buhalakis, uh that had to leave in January. And I'm not comparing players, uh, but I don't know. The, the club just give up on the best potential of the squad, like because I don't really understand why. He did bad games, like I'm not debating that, but he, he went from starter to like uh, cut players, like almost beat him player. And the way we handle that, like refusing many offers from abroad, uh, <laughs> refusing many offers from abroad to loan him to Atromitos for six months, I, I don't really get it. And this, this summer, we're doing the same situation, like refusing. Yeah. Uh, I, I remember be, at the beginning of the summer, uh, we had an offer from Vienne in Austria. And if you loan Agibu, even with an option of four or five million in a league like Austria, like Belgium, you know uh, he's, he's going to, to make it, like he's going to, to perform very nicely. You just need some place to develop. Like it can't be in Olympiacos, I get it. But just don't loan him to Atromitos. Right. The good thing is he'll be, he will he will play. He will be a starter. He will have game on his feet. And even if we if he don't come back to Olympiacos at the end of the loan, probably he will have to be sold because he won't renew. Like I can't guarantee he won't renew at the club. There is no way he renew at Olympiacos to be sold later. Like it's not happening. So. And Andreas point the Afcon and the situation that is there is Afcon this this season too, so maybe Olympiacos don't don't want to have a mid final that would be missing one month of competition during the winter. Yeah, but it's maybe it's just my opinion, but we won't see a player like Hagibu coming to Olympiacos uh, anymore because it's very difficult to find players like this on the market. I'm not saying he's a warranted starter for Olympiacos. Probably Martin's mistake was playing him over and over. Uh, maybe yeah. it was the club's holder to play him as much as possible to make a big sale. But potential like that aren't easy to find on the market. They cost money. And I will always remember that game in Fenerbahce because that night I really saw a player that could have been someone like Prudence in terms of sale. Yeah. But no, he's not I, a wasted talent. He's wasted yeah. by the club, but he's not wasted yet. He's 22. Yeah. And his loan in Atromitos was kind of good. I watched his game. The team around him wasn't that good. But maybe during a full, a full year of, of football with Atromitos, he can find his, his game again. Yeah. Uh, and this comment from Aries Pan is is pretty spot on for me also. Without Agibu, we don't win our last title. Simple as that. The momentum gained from those two wins versus Balk and Ike, that came 100% thanks to him. That was crucial. Uh, somebody brought up the Fenerbahce uh, game earlier. Um, I think it was the first leg against Fenerbahce. He was, um, he was yeah. great. It's just the mold of the player is just not it, – it's a, it's a square piece in a circular hole – comparing yeah. the system that we have now that's the only problem but i agree with you martial um yeah it's it, it really is on a little bit unfortunate and Imagine and i in, yeah in the belgian league i yeah. guess he's made for that Belgian league i i was scrolling on gank transfer markets page because i didn't knew all the player of the club yeah hagibu is the player that if you put him in gank or a club like that even charleroi I know, I, I know the, the city is shit. It's ugly as, as fuck. But who cares? Like, I'm not sure Agibu even care about the city itself. No, no offense to anybody that lives. No, in but that it's, part well of known. The it's well no, known. No, yes, offense. City. It's a shithole. Sorry. It's such a horrible place. But the fact is, even in France, man, I, I just understand. I just don't understand why the club refuses so many foreign offers. That's my only question. Otherwise, the, 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 the problem would be solved like very quickly. Yeah. If the club would, will say, for example, we want to loan him in Atromitos to have a close look to him in order to make him come back next summer. But, but we know it's bullshit. 
Like you don't loan someone to Atromitos to have a closer look. Uh, yeah, I don't buy it. I, I maybe maybe there's an element of they don't want to sell him because maybe just in case something happens with the season, maybe they can get use out of him again next season. I I don't know. I couldn't tell you, but I, I'm with both of you on on this case. Um, well, moving on, uh, that was really the two major departures that we wanted to cover today, Agibu going on loan, and then, of course, the big Oleg sale, which is extremely important in terms of what we can afford for the transfer window. So speaking on transfers, little arrival update on the players that we now have officially signed. So at the time that we did our live show last season, or last season, good Lord, last week, uh, we had signed uh, Vicente Ibora, Kini, and Freire. And then since that show, we have now signed Jackson Porozo, the Ecuadorian center back, uh, Alexandropoulos, the midfielder from Sporting Lisbon, and now Ayub El Kabi, literally just before, about an hour before the show, they announced him. We knew he was coming in over the weekend, but they just announced him. So that's uh, a total of, I mean, for first team players, not including players we purchased and sent out on loan, uh, six players that we have brought in. There's also the winger from Maribor, uh, Ivan Brinich, uh, that is su supposedly Slovenian sources have said that the deal is basically done. Uh, he had a buyout clause of around one and a half million. We were apparently trying to negotiate it down, maybe perhaps not to have to pay the full amount. And Maribor, because they had lost the, their striker who had led the season in, or their leading strut score, I should say, they had lost him. They didn't want to lose, lose another one. So I guess, uh, you know, that's some a lot of business has happened since August. We told you the business was going to happen in August. And so far, Cordon, Chef Cordon has not disappointed. He's cooking. Hashtag let him cook, boys. And uh, he kept me busy this week, at least. I didn't leave my office most nights when I was home. But anyway, hope you guys enjoyed all the scouting reports. But a lot of business has been done this week. And we have two rumors. Um, the first one being another center back from the same team that we signed Nicolas Freire from. This has been going nuts in Mexican sports media. Um, uh I don't know exactly how reliable that is because we're already trying to figure out how to make space for all the foreigners we do have. Are we really going to bring in another foreigner? And then we have Sergi uh, Cardona from Las Palmas, who supposedly we made a 2 million euro offer for. Uh, he's a left back as well. Two and a half million. I think that was according to Gotzi Setodeca. So this is what the updated look is. We've got six new players in uh, that are, are all going to be on the European list for this upcoming qualifier and uh, a, a potentially a new winger coming out of uh, Slovenia. So this time, Marcial, you get started. Uh, there's, there's a poll going on uh, right now asking if you think we're ready for gank. Did we make enough signings? Do you see enough that has been done? I would say yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say also I'm not sure gank is ready for Olympiacos, and I'm not saying that because uh, we're, a, we're a super team, but they do not seem ready at all. Like they have a, tons of good players, young players, but the team itself doesn't look ready. Like they lost, if I'm not correct, this weekend in the league. They, they drew to serve it like with one man up. Uh, so between the, those two teams, I'm not sure with, we are the one not ready. Uh, Concerning the signing, I kind of like what I see until now because it's players I don't really know. I'm curious to see how they can uh, behave in that new uh, era of Olympiacos with Martinez. Uh, probably one friendly with all of them would have been uh, lovable to see, like El Khabib even playing, I don't know, half, a, half an hour but also in defense. But it's qualifiers reality, and we have no time to integrate those players. And I, I don't know. I have a tons of questions, and I don't have really answers until now. But to answer the comment about Poroso and Palmer Brown, the, the issue is that Troyes was a, 
was probably one of the worst defense last season because the coach coach wanted to play uh, typical like city group tactic. I think it was three center backs, and he had players that weren't used to play like that. But I do believe Poroso has much more potential. Like, I'm, it's difficult to say if, if it's better at the at the moment, but he has more potential. Like, if Martinez is able to develop him, to make him progress on some points, I think we do have a, a good defender on our hands. But he's not coming like Semedo. When he came, you knew he was going to be the leader of the defense. Costa. Yeah, more general comment on the transfers. Uh, and before I do that, actually, I want to congratulate you for all the work that you've done. Yes. Uh, making those deep dives and, you know, uh, shout out from me and probably on behalf of all the community guys, Ari puts in a lot of work, uh, and spends a lot of time to make those scouting reports. And they always come out right after uh, the players announced, uh, some of you will have noticed. So show some love. Um, and yeah, just wanted to wanted to say that you can get early access to those as well if you become a Patreon member. Shameless plug. And now to the the meat on the bone. So the transfers. I think I think we can safely kind of say that the transfers are all of them until now fairly low risk uh, and free. Yeah, we're, we're talking about loans with option and free transfers. So we haven't spent money on transfer fees for any of these players so far. And I would agree with that general sentiment that they are um, low risk moves, but for the center back. Because, you know, I think some, some of you have asked in the comments, starting lineup for, uh, for Thursday's game against Genk. And honestly, I don't know what he's going to do at centre-back. Everywhere else on the pitch, I can tell you who's going to play. Maybe there's a question mark in midfield over Camara or Inbom. The trio in midfield, does Carvalho start uh, as a 10? Does he play Camara and Juan? Never played in friendlies together. But at the back, Kinney. Kinney's going to play. I think he was solid when we saw him at left back in all in all the friendlies he was involved. Uh, you know, has some goal involvements too. Ibora, we know what we've signed there. We've signed experienced players that can come in and contribute from the get go. No adaptation time. Um, good signings in my book, and one year one year deals. Then. Uh, Alexandropoulos, I won't, I won't go into that further, but, but the centre-backs, you don't have your stalwart leader at the back. It's like Freire, who played, I think, a season in, in Holland for Zwolle. That's all the European experience he has. And then there's Poroso, who looks super, super exciting prospect. Like amazing physical attributes, um, fast, can get up and down the field. But I don't know. Like I don't know what he's going to start on Thursday. I think there's talk that it's probably going to be Freire and Dretos. But again, like those those two players never played in any friendly. So that's those are the two. If I have any qualms, let's say, with our transfer policy so far, I would have liked to have signed a centre-back with some gravitas, someone with a reputation, someone with experience, somebody that can come in and stamp the authority and say, look, I'm going to lead this back line because we don't have that. Uh, and that's the, only, that's the only part of the transfer strategy so far where I think we haven't quite been able to get what we really needed. And that's not, you know, that's not to, not to say that Perozo might end up being absolutely amazing for us. Huh? Right. Um, the, the scout report that you did is super interesting. Um, if anyone hasn't seen that, go and check that out. Um, yeah, that, that's pretty much what I have to say about the transfers that we've, 
that we've made so far, and we can talk about the other rumors after. The um, uh, first, I want thank you, Costa, and I also want to thank uh, a couple of guys showing me some love. Thank you, uh, Alexandrosism and Ben De Rosia. Uh, I also got some wellness checks from people <laughs> last weekend over the weekend, making sure I wasn't burning myself out. So I appreciate all of you for that. But there's a couple questions here that um, I think we should address. Uh, first is from Zigual. My question is, why do we go and sign all of these bets, in quotations, from abroad without considering similar value Greek players? And the answer to that is, Zigual, have you noticed, first of all, the early signings that Diego Martinez has made? He And, and this goes for Cordon as well. They have been signing players that they are familiar with first. Uh, some a lot of these players they've interacted with. In fact, Gordon knows Perozo from his time when he was sporting director at Ecuador. Just, just some context for you guys there. It is not unusual when a new coach comes in, especially in a situation like Olympiacos is in, like the, the, the club is in, chaotic, uh, a club that demands results, demands action, Coaches are going to go with who they trust, who they are familiar with. And in, in, in many cases, we see them trust more veteran players. And it doesn't surprise me that he's going to trust people that, that he has coached in the past. That's short term. That's why, that's, that's why that has happened. Do I agree with some, the, some of the players? Do I wish maybe he's gone for some similar Greek talent? Of course I do. But this is, this is just the reality. Uh, question here from Aris Galamatis. Can we hear why Poroso has more potential than Doi? I don't think anybody said Poroso had more potential than Doi, but he's a player that the coach and the sporting director are familiar with. And two, also for me, Doi, even last season, we kind of talked about what he is good and what he isn't good about in, in terms of his defense. And, and, and in the friendlies, if you go based on just purely how his performances were in the friendlies, I'm not going to say he was amazing because I don't think he was. He played a little bit as center mid. He can play both. He'll probably be kept as a versatile option. I don't know what's going to happen with a with, with Doy. I, I don't. I really don't know. It a lot of there's going to be plenty of competition. But one thing I can tell you guys, and if you've been watching the deep dives, the scouting reports, you're going to notice two trends with Diego Martinez, right? The first trend is he's bringing in players with specific mentality, right? He, he's looking for mentality, fighters' mentalities, people that are willing to, to put everything on the pitch, train very hard. That is one thing. The, the, the second thing is Diego Martinez wants diverse skill sets. He likes to play different types of schemes in different situations. We've seen a couple of, in the friendlies, two, I'll say there are two schemes that we've seen the most. But this is the type of coach he is. And uh, every person that we brought in, the skill sets are not exactly the same. We're looking at some, not even similar profiles, but a lot of people with unique skills, right? Um, I try to compare players to other players to show how different some of these players are. Like Usain Uba offers different things than um Porozo does Doi offers different things than Ba Doi offers different things than Porozo Frere is similar Ibora in the midfield similar Retzos has actually been pretty good in friendlies we have a lot of different skill sets in these different positions and that would that's what Diego Martinez wants so focus on that what we will see uh I, I get the concern from everybody about the Greek players and I I do understand that but this year the coach is going to go with the players he's seen doing the best in training and who he trusts the most. And we can't ask more for that right now. Things go well this season moving forward. I think we can put the magnifying glass on that a little bit more. But right now, we've got to do what's going to we've got to do what's going to work and succeed. Marcial, go ahead. The first thing I wanted to say is uh does Endoy's season last season was as good as we think, or it's biased by the fact the season was a complex, complete shit show that we were happy to see a young player for the club playing with the first team? Right. Uh, that's my first point. 
And the second one is, I really want to see Rezos playing with uh, not good defender, but someone that is not uh, shaky or not injury prone or not mistake prone. Because last season, the, the defense like changed every month, maybe. You had Socrates. No, we, we started with Manola, Socrates. Then Manolas left. Then Socrates was supposed to be the leader. Then Cisse came back. Then Ba came back. Then Endoy popped in the, the first team. So you can't uh, build the defense with, with uh, such instability. But Retzos, if he's able not to injure himself, uh, I think I, I'm, I, I'm pretty sure it will be if not the main chance, the main choice, one of the main choices of Martinez for the defense, because he, he knows how to play with the ball. And probably we were lacking that in the team. And I'm not expecting Endoy to play that much in defense. I might be wrong. I don't, I can't predict the future, but I'm not very enthusiastic to see Endoy being a central defender with Olympiacos. Like maybe right. in the midfield, being a six, like more aggressive, maybe uh, to do what Samaseku did last season, maybe better than that. He has a place to claim in that position, but in defense, I'm not sure we can do what he did last season because every time we played against a bigger team or a big team, he was not in trouble, but he, you, you, you could see the, the point he has to improve in his game to be a center back. In my opinion, there's uh, a lot of discussion I'm seeing in chat right now about not just the cash that we're not spending, uh, but not spending on Greek Greek football players, but just in general the types of moves that were that are being made. Uh, one the, one comment in particular that's encompassing this: uh, I cannot believe that with one one and a half million you can't find promising players from Greek teams. The first, there, there's two things that I think we need to reiterate in case you guys haven't been aware of the conversations that we've had before about this. The first thing is the club is under serious financial pressure this summer. We have major FFP concerns. We had a huge deadline on July, which we made it through. We weren't one of the clubs that were punished under FFP. There's another one coming in October. We are under scrutiny. Three straight years of losses. Our club president has put eight figures in terms of millions of euro into the club to cover losses. Okay. That is not something that FFP looks kindly upon when it comes to clubs like us, Manchester city, PSG. Some of those clubs can get away with murder. We cannot. So everything we're doing this summer is adhering to some of these very strict rules. And don't forget, I brought this up every show I've been on this summer. This year, this season, our club cannot spend more than 90% of the revenues we bring in on wages, employee benefit expense. That includes backroom staff, by the way. So our club is being very careful because we've had losses. And if we have more losses or we overspend again, we'll be in trouble. That, that means we could make even less signings in Europe. So all of these deals being done, loans, loans with buyouts, everything we're doing is pushing the expenditure to next year, hoping that we do decently in Europe and we get more money or we make player sales mm -hmm. so that we can revisit this next year. So all I can tell you guys is just get used to it. We have to sell. We sold Oleg. Now we can have a little bit of a transfer budget, but unless we make more sales, we can't spend more money. That's just how it is. We have to deal with that. You have to accept that. This is our reality this summer. Maybe we can bring more players in in the winter. But you can't do that until you secure Europe. If we secure Europa League, we can add to our – we can – or what's the word I'm looking for? Um, oh, my goodness. You can speculate in addition of – for us, I think it would be 15 or 16 million euros. We can add that to our revenue, which then we can use to either bring more players in you know, the first week of September or in the winter window. But until that happens, we have to sell more players. 
So considering the restrictions that we have, guys, and the player pools we have access to, and what Olympiacos has to offer some of these other players, we've made some pretty frugal and pretty practical signings. That's how I feel about them. Costa, Marcial, are you in agreement with that? I feel like you are, but I, I could be wrong. No, oh, you're right. You're that right. This is just how it is. So you have to remember that. And every, credit every to club. Cordon. Yeah. Every club uh, postponed deals to the next summer. Like when Mbappe, I remember when Mbappe go, uh, went to Paris, it was a loan with a mandatory option for the next summer, like just to balance books for the next summer. And that's why we got caught with Onyekuru last summer. Like we paid 5 million straight for someone that wasn't playing in Monaco. And probably this summer, we went back to the Turkish way of doing things like loans with options. And then at the end of it, you decide if you want to activate them. Like maybe negotiate them on a lower basis. Right. And like Porto did with Semedo, for example. And it's it's uh, probably an evolution we needed to to have. Right. Um, uh, there's a comment here from Nick Raptis. If we don't have enough money, then why not use players like Kitsos, Leidner, yeah. Agibu, Ba, Kalogeropoulos, or Doi uh, at CDM the last and current season? Uh, well, current season, Doran Leidner's hurt. He had uh, ACL surgery. So he's not going to be available after rehab. He wouldn't be available until probably winter at the earliest anyway. So that's one. Kitsos, that's an unfortunate case. We still don't know what the what the fee was to move him to Volos. Um, but that probably had more to do with FFP as well, making a sale that meant certain things. He's a sellable asset. It is really unfortunate. We all agree, but it that, that's probably the case with that. Agibu, he doesn't fit the system, we told you. Um, last year, the the different coaches that came in didn't rate him. With, the, another, we were kind of already discussed that, the unfortunate. Uh, Agassim Ba, I don't think his permit, did we ever get any news whether or not his work permit went through? I don't think it has yet. I don't He's know. training with the first team. He is training with the first team. Okay. Yeah. So Agibu or Agibu, sorry, Agassim Ba had a work permit issue, which is why he wasn't part of the training in the team earlier, but he is training with the first team now. Thank you, Costa. Galo don't Yeropoulos. Confuse, oh, don't go ahead. Confuse, don't confuse residence permit with visa. Residence Thank permit. You. Residence permit is why he came back from youth AFCON. That's dealt with. Now he has to deal with the visa issue. But I know that he's training with the first team. Thank you. Uh, and then Kalogeropoulos, technically, his contract ended this past July 1st. So, don't know. Uh, yeah. yeah Can I just say something? Um, when it comes to, I mean, all these players named here, they're under 22, I guess. Um, so, before... Or even when Martinez came in, beginning of the summer, we were talking about Babis Costulas, um, Christos Musakitis, yeah. these gems that we have in the academy, and that they would go to preseason with the team. And this this was for sure. Yeah, this is how it was presented. Um, Jose Anigo was talking about them at the end of last season. There was a lot of hype around these two players in particular from the academy. Crickets now. No one's saying anything about them. Nobody knows. Uh, Babis Costulas um, didn't travel to Austria because apparently he got injured right before the right before the team flew uh, to, to head out to Austria. And um, Muzakidis apparently had an injury at the end of last season that, that kept him kept him out of training uh, when the first team regrouped. So why am I saying all of this? It's clear to me that the new hierarchy. The Spaniards, they understand that there's no room for error and there's no room for much experimenting. Particularly when you're talking about a 16-year-old striker. And I think, again, was I give this over 16 or 17? Yep. I think he's he's older than, he's one year older than, than Costulas. So 
that's I think I think it's a conscious decision of the management that we don't have the time to experiment and build around these young players. And sadly, that is just how Olympiacos is, um, particularly in this kind of situation now when we're coming out of a shit show season and we're trying to rebuild um, our reputation included on a European scale, because I think our reputation did take a hit this past season. Um, so I, I think, again, my point is, I think it's a conscious decision that players yeah. like Kitsos was given away on a free transfer with a buyback option, that yeah. Costulas isn't being talked about anymore, that Muzakidis isn't being talked about anymore. Um, and, and you see it in the transfer moves as well. The first transfers that were made, they're all 33 plus players and you know some of you in the in the comments are going off and saying yeah but there's one year deals and then after a year back to square one no it's not because you know they signed Alexandropoulos who can play further back or you know you, you, some of the fan base you, you guys have got to decide what you want as well sorry if I'm sounding like a prick but when we sign a player that's above 33 he's too old when we sign a player that's 21 or 22 oh he's too young so like, what do you want like you can't attract top top players in their peak at 26, 28, whatever it is, to come and right. play in Greece. You can either buy experienced players like an Ibotta, like a Kinney, that can come in and you know be role players, and you can sign some you know gems that you have to scout. You have to look really hard to find them. I didn't know about this uh, Brinich guy, the Croatian that plays for Maribor. We'll talk about him later. Yeah. And yeah. there, there's questions also about like yeah. FFP. Um, uh, another one from uh, Adi's asking how Kitsos affects FFP versus the waste of Marcelo, Rosalico, and James from last year. The, I, I think you misunderstood the effect on the FFP I'm talking about. Kitsos' effect on the FFP was not negative. It's not about his wage or that he was like taking away. It's about what his sale or what his offloading – means for the club to fix the books because you're right versalico marcelo and james those wages killed us even though we didn't pay them the entire year even though versalico left at one point even though marcelo was gone and james also didn't stay the full season that impacted us very 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 negatively and the sales or the i say the transfer of gotsis in the manner that we did, all of these things were done so that the books could balance properly by the deadline in July. That's why this was all done so that we could adhere to the new policy. So it's, uh, I, I understand all of your frustration. I, I get it. I, I get it. And if this were any other season, um, I, I would also say that, listen, I want more Greeks to, to play. But, but, not, but if understanding what this coach is coming into, I get why he's doing the way he's – I get what he's doing and why he's doing it, we'll say. Now, if it does or doesn't work, we can say, I told you so. It's, um, it's unfortunate. Now, if there's success this year and we have another summer next year to build, then I think we have much more of a leg to stand on when we say, look, guys, we have to do bring in more B-team players. We have to bring in, try and help the, the system move. But this, this year, it's about turning the ship and riding the ship. It's not, the coach is not thinking about developing our talent from the academy. Marcial, uh, did you have something? Yeah, because I'm saying comments about the, the academy, the B team and stuff. And I wanted to say two things, like, in fact, three things. The first thing is under 19 is going to play, are going to play the youth league for the first time since uh, years. And if I'm not correct, if I'm not wrong, sorry, the last generation that played it was Andruchos, Mandatis, Simicas, like all of them played the youth league at the same time. And the, the best way to stopping making bets on the market is developing your own uh, product, if I can say that. And the youth league is way better for the under-19 uh, than playing in the Super League 2. And concerning the B team, know that uh, Ibagasa came back to lead the team 
I have better hopes for the next season because I know that he's a real coach. We saw that when he came back last season. And maybe some players uh, that were champion last season with under-19 will uh, continue uh, improving with Ibagasa. Because Ibagasa also speaks the same language as uh, Martinez. Right. I, I don't, I'm not saying it's the, the key factor there, but I went to see the B team once uh, in May last, last season. And you know that Ibagasa is a world coach. He could have been the first team coach last season for me, but he will be a first team coach very soon. Like It's, it's like when Pablo Garcia took over Park. He knows uh, how to handle players. He knows the club, knows the reality. His son is playing with the, the B team too. And I was very pleased from what I saw. And the last thing I wanted to say is I've, I've seen comments about uh, making more deals on the Greek market. And I don't disagree with that because we all remember Masuras coming on a small fee from Panionios and it turned out to be, it turned out to be a very good signing. But the, the only team that those that know seems to be Ike because they took like Von Wirt to Volos, they took Fernandez to Volos. But the thing is, when you get to the point that you have ambitions, who will, who will be the player that will be cut? It's player from the Greek market because Juan Vip, no, Ponce came, is, is going to leave. Uh, Fernandez is injured, but if you sign Pineda for 7 million, you're going to sideline Fernandez. And they don't produce Greek players either, either like Panathinaikos, Haik. Just name me one academy player that will play this season. Like Vajanidis might be the only one out of those two teams. So even with even if the situation in the Olympiakos looks scary, I'm not I'm I don't think we have to be worried about that. The only team right. that works nicely for me is Pauk, but with Lucescu going for the fifth season, I would say, uh, I'm not very Optimistic for them. Uh, comment here from Adi Spahn about the uh, the academy situation. He says, guys, I don't want to burst your bubble, but the academy, at least until very recently, did a dreadful job at producing talent. Absolutely dreadful. Maybe the last batch of U18s can change that. Um, we have to say that since Anigo came, things seem like they're starting to turn around with the academies. So we'll... We'll see. We'll see what happens. Uh, again, I think. I think at this point we're kind of beating the dead horse. We this season don't expect a lot in terms of the development front, right? The players that are the probably the most ready, like Al Ba, who looked great when he was healthy in second division last year, he'll probably get some looks. Uh, you know, we'll see what kind of playing time Alexandropoulos gets, but don't expect us this season to care at all about the development of players because this season is about returning the ship back to where it used to be. So I think that's just something we have to settle for. Does it suck? Yes. Do we all want to see Greek players? Olympiacos have more Greek players? Yes, of course we do. But right now the coach is going to go with who he's more comfortable with. He's not going to be going with Academy prospects in a country. He doesn't know that he's never seen before. That's just, that's just the reality. It's unfortunate, you, but it's the reality. It is yeah. what it is. So you don't, I, yeah, you don't need to have like 10 wonder kids at the same time. If you can right. produce uh, one Solakis, one Endoy, right. then it's okay. Solakis exactly. goalkeeper is a very difficult position. Like I'm okay with Olympiacos having probably Solakis, Retsos, Endoy, Vrusai, and Andruzos in the squad, like all of them have different roles, different potential, but the academy is there to produce like big sales, a rotation player, useful player. I don't know. Like, yeah, no, and, and you're right. You're expecting too much from an academy. I would say you're right. Uh, I, I think you're right. And we had, uh, God, was it a year ago now? Costa, we had, um, a, a good friend of mine. Uh, his name is Perry. And he used to work for Sigma, F Sigma FC in Canada, uh, an academy in Canada that's produced talents like Alfonso Davies, Kyle Lahren, uh, 
some of the biggest names in Canadian football have come out of there. And he, and he said something very similar about like, you know, not every name is going to come out. You have players that are just never going to hit that, that level, but you get these situations where look, this guy, he talked about like Siopis going and, and playing in Turkey and succeed in Turkey. Like that's a win for him. You know what I mean? As far as the Academy is concerned, forget about business side of Olympiacos. And, but these are the types of things that, uh, that he was talking about. So I, I think he would agree with you. And I agree with you also Martial in, in that respect. Um, uh, but uh, Costa, before we kind of go on to like the gank discussion, uh, you said you wanted to talk about the Slovenian. The Croatian. Or sorry, the Croatian. Come from, coming from, from Slovenia. Slovenia. Coming from Maribor. Sorry, from Slovenia. My apologies. Yes, the Croatian coming from Slovenian club Maribor. Yeah, so I think this is, besides Sergi Cardona, who's been, who's been rumored as a potential left-back signing, Ivan Bunic has been in the press the last couple of days. I think it was revealed yesterday in the Slovenian media that we're talking to him. He has a buyout of one and a half million, around one and a half million euros. And anyone who's looked at some quick, quick YouTube videos, stats, this is a player that played around 44 games last season, scored eight goals, 13 assists. Um, they played, I think, Conference League last season. He started the season well. This season, five appearances, two goals, two assists. He's 21. He turns 22, I think, the back end of August. And he looks exciting. Um, I don't know if that just, I don't know if that's because we haven't seen a winger, like a pure winger, play for this club in, in I feel like, so long, like since Daniel Pedenza left. Um, and as soon as you watch some tape, you just see a, a player with a low centre of gravity that gets the ball at his feet and the first thing he does is he runs at people. Um, and, you know, we haven't looked at, we haven't done enough analysis on the player. Um, right. Deep dive pending, if and when he signs. But he looks very, very exciting. It looks like this could be an astute bit of business. It would be the first transfer fee that we pay this season this is a young player with a low transfer fee that you know this could explode if he right. turns out to be anything as good as i think he can be then this is a player that you bring in for one million and you sell him for double but like you sell him for 10 in one or two seasons time and you know at the end of the day like I don't care if it's Brunich, to be perfectly clear, but we need, for the love of God, we need a winger that can get the ball on the byline and run at the defenders because we're just too predictable out on the yeah. wings um, right now. So Slovenian reports, again, now are saying that this is close to being done. Um, so let's keep an eye on that one. Sparos saying that uh, it wasn't us that bullied Kennedy. It was definitely Lambro that bullied Kennedy and the deal collapsed. Guys, did you see his uh, Instagram pictures? That dude was fat. He looked as fat as Marcelo did. So yeah. there's he, a reason he, why he failed his medical. He looked, like, he looked like someone that would have ended up in uh, the Portuguese coach Instagram saying like, look who's got fitter minus five kilos with a picture on Instagram, like like it did with Ronnie Lopez and all the player that came before. Yeah, but exactly. Coming back to the creation guy, uh, how's, how's the club working on that? Like, I mean, who discovered that player? Does it mean we're working with scouts? We're working with data? I don't know, because it's not a market we go into really... Often, if I'm not correct, I'm not wrong. But we were looking at their striker too, the yeah. one that ended up in Bordeaux, because he was oh, on, exactly. he was on the lists. And Maribor has done quite well in Europe the last couple of seasons, or like they've yeah. they they've um, they've picked up a few like bigger scalps, you know, for the size of their team at least. Like you think Maribor, and you think okay, but they've got some decent results in Europe the last couple of seasons. Yeah. That's that's a hundred percent true. 
somebody. But, but it's funny though. You look at his market value. It's like 800, 800 K. Yeah. I and wonder why think... it's so slow. So low. Yeah. Are you guys, like you guys this. as confident I, about this comment? I, I, I like this. As long as he's not signing for anyone from Brentford, then I think there's, I think there's a chance. Yeah. Uh, and the comment says for, for anyone that's not watching the video, Canos will be here in a month. I still have faith. Valencia made an offer for or no transfer fee, only bonuses. We can do it. We'll see. We'll see. I would love, God, I would love to see him back, man. You know what's funny? Uh, I went on Transfermarkt to see how many Croatian played for Olympiacos. And the one that played most equal was Versoko. Nine games. <laughs> And the other one was the the one you spoke about on Twitter. I can't remember Butina. the name. No, he played. Butina. Yeah, maybe. No, the, the one that got subbed uh, against Liverpool. Oh fuck, Rezic. Yeah, nine games too. Otherwise, oh, wow. it's it's uh, Helvoje Milic. Do you remember that guy? Yeah. Left back. Yeah. And yeah. the 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 goalkeeper. That never played, but he's doing a great career. I went to Paphos last year. It's yeah. not a country that do that did amazing things with Olympiacos, unfortunately. But before we move away from rumors, can we address the Mike James? I know you guys are not basketball people, but <laughs> the Mike James rumors. Oh my god! Like I heard about this on Thursday, Friday switching over to basketball for five minutes thursday friday people start sending me messages they're like mike james is signing for olympiacos this weekend it's like are you fucking crazy there's no way this is happening yeah so mike james one of the best shooting guards in europe <sighs> anyway so anyone that's been on social media all of you most of you this weekend will have seen like lots of Soon, soon, hold, like you know, Mel Gibson holding a bloody sword. Hold, hold, it's coming. <laughs> Padelizia Madopoulos put out an article and he went there. He's like, Libyagos is looking at Mike James and Panathinaikos is looking at Tyler Dorsey. And all shit broke loose. And then the club came out and they made a statement saying, Libyagos doesn't engage with players that are under contract. contract. Yeah. They didn't say... They didn't refute or deny the Mike James rumor. They just said, <laughs> we do not engage with players that are under contract. So this is still bubbling away at the surface. Everyone's saying that the clubs agreed with the player, that the players talked to Thomas Walkup, that Thomas Walkup's talked to Barzokas and told Barzokas' coach, like, it's all good, like, he'll fit the system, he'll, he's ready, he's mature. Mike James has talked to the coach. These, these are all the rumours. Um, and now there's a funny one. There's a picture that surfaced on the internet, and it's a picture of one of the presidents, Yorgos Agelopoulos, in Naxos, and it's been posted by Femi Sinanoglu, who's one of the editors at FOSS, does a lot of those great interviews that they put uh, in the paper. And it's a picture of a famous Olympiacos fan in Naxos with Yorkos Agelopoulos. And um, Femis is saying that the guy that took the picture with, with one of the presidents said, the president asked him, are you gonna, are you gonna ask me the question? The question that's on everyone's lips. He's insinuating Mike James. And the answer was patience, patience, patience. So um, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, please don't ask me whether this is true or not. But, you know, there's a saying in Greek where there's smoke, there's fire. So I would, I would love to see this happen. We just need that kind of player when, you know, when shit gets stuck. So give the ball to Mike James and let him do his thing so yeah th th there was no way that we were doing a pod today and not talking about that so i just wanted to address that real quick yeah and see the thing is like i, I mean i haven't followed mike james on twitter very long but he's usually quite vocal um when it comes yeah. to like fake rumors and stuff and he hasn't said a thing about it so that's for to me yesterday 
Yeah. He, he commented on some NBA stuff yesterday. Yeah, but, that's well, it. I, so hang on, hang on a minute, mate. There's like, there's loads of stuff being said about you, and you're, you know, quote commenting on some, you know, NBA some stuff. N, some NBA stuff, but yeah. it's like you're not saying anything about this. And this is a player that's also said like. I want Olympiacos to lose all the time because I yep. hate their fans. Like he said shit like that. He said yep. shit about Panathinaikos as well. Like I don't put put all that stuff aside. Like things change in sports and people say shit, stupid shit. If we can get Mike James, bomb, biggest bomb in European basketball this season by far, by far. Absolutely. Um, well, back on the football train. Where we've gone actually over an hour. I can't believe an hour's gone already. And uh, we haven't touched on much on Genk at all. Uh, I know uh, we told you guys before if, if we can get the schedules to match up with the Belgian football, co- uh, my God, Belgian football podcast, we will get some insight from them about Genk and what they can offer. But we did, um, we do have a little bit, some numbers, some analysis about the club that we can talk to you guys about uh with with gank i know uh we were all surprised to see servette progress at gank's expense i wasn't expecting it um especially with everything lombro told us about how much servette sucked i expected i expected utter domination but that wasn't the case um so we're playing against gank and i watched the first game live i watched some replays of the second game and i looked at some of the data and they didn't look great in the first leg they looked better in the second leg they also lost their first league game i believe it was um against uh who was it you 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 pen or something like that they lost they lost to urpen today urpen that was it yes today or yesterday one nil one nothing so they've lost their they haven't won a competitive match And they've played three so far. They haven't won one yet. And it's not necessarily because they're a god-awful team. Their underlying, their underlying stats are actually pretty good. They, in terms of possession, in terms of opportunity creation, against Servette over two leg, their total XG was 6.3 versus Servette's was 2.85. But they had something like 10 shots on target, 15 shots in total in the second. The second game, I think I saw. That uh, that is true. They did have in the second game, but they had uh, like if we're they had eight big scoring chances, and and four of them came in the first game. So the, they they make they make scoring chances. They do. They they also in terms of their their overall ball possession, it was like if you average it over both legs, it was it was over sixty percent. They move the ball that. Uh, I was looking at how they move the ball on the wings. It's not bad. These guys just can't finish. They can't finish, and they are they are pretty suspect defensively. Uh, the Urpen team that they played against and lost one nothing. It, the the total xG against was 0.27, and they lost one nothing. It it was so bad, so so sad. But it's it's not that they it's not that these guys can't make opportunities. They do. They just have they just they can't finish. And my my what I'm telling the fans is because I want you I want you guys to be prepared because I don't want us going into this game thinking oh this team sucks they lost to Servette uh, this you know this is going to be a, an easy qualification because I don't think it is. All it takes is for them to finish one or two of these chances that they missed in their in their two legs against Servette, and next thing you know, we're already trying to to compete against um, uh, conf- you know for conference league. It it it's it's crazy. I mean, these guys had like in this game against UPenn. Um, I'm pulling up the the Y scout. I had it up earlier, but I mean, they had. <sighs> Like double, they had well over double digit shots. I mean, this was this is crazy that they missed all of these opportunities and then conceded against a team that had a total of 0.27 xg. It's absurd. 27 shots, Costa. 27 shots, 2.07 xg to 0.27, and they lost one nothing. That is absurdity. That's like a really bad FIFA match when you're online dominating the guy you're playing against. 
and then he gets this like annoying deflection type of goal and that's what they score against so like i don't know i don't know man i don't think i, I don't think this is going to be an easy 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 match for us at all i think this we're gonna have our hands full uh especially we, you look at the the squad list you look at who's available we already talked about we had concerns about some players maybe getting a little bit too far forward Rodin a, for example is one of them we we don't look amazing so far on the wings midfield um God forbid also something happened to Yusef El Arabi. We've talked about that a lot. Maybe now with with Kabi, who knows if we can integrate him in time. I'm I'm nervous, man. I don't know about you guys, but I'm really nervous. More nervous than I was at least a couple weeks ago. But I'm nervous. Marcial, you're, you're on mute, mute Marcia. Sorry, sorry. Isn't it the perfect opposite draw we could have, like, compared if I if you take a look at how the club is run, the transfer pol policy, transfer uh, the the way they play, like Genk is like the anti Olympiacos, like only young players in the squad. Uh, I mean, it's I don't I'm kind of scared to play this team because I'm expecting very fast wingers, lots of technique quality, uh, apart from the strikers they have that. Reminds me a little bit of Piero. Like, mm -hmm. It's better, but it's the he's a very powerful striker that came to France to play in League Two in the past. Uh, but I don't know. It smells a uh, Masuras masterclass for me. I don't know why, but <laughs> the kind of game Masuras is able to win, like like he did in Fenerbahce. She, like the the. Remind you? Do you remember the goal he scored against? I think it was Basak Seir, the header he had, the first Valbuena's assist with Olympiacos. I'm expecting a situation like that, like not even a big occasion, but Masuras being able to score out of nowhere. Small victory, but also at the same time, I'm very scared. Who wants to tell Yorgos Mustakas? Deadline, um, we have until Tuesday. We can make changes to the squad. Uh, actually, we submitted a 23-player yeah. squad yeah. and we have a possibility to add two players and change players. So that's something yeah. to keep in mind for Tuesday. I don't know if the, the winger and the left-back are going to be signed by then. Let's see. Um, so Tuesday, Tuesday night, we have, uh, that's the next deadline. Um, answering on this question about how I feel about the draw and the game. I am also very nervous. I think it's normal going into the first game of the season, first official game. You know, everyone's talking about the fact that their league started. They played qualifiers already. They're, they're theoretically more prepared fitness wise like match fitness wise but i think nerves are good i think that you know we all falsely believed that Servette was going to be the one that would pop up because you know yep. genk is a team that has a market value of above 100 million euros so something like 130 i think last i checked and ours is around 80 just to compare the two so i think I think that the players will be more awake. I don't think, you know, you go into a game against Genk and you think, okay, this is a team from a, like it or not, guys, superior league. Yeah. Superior league than ours. They're all, like Marshall said, young profiles, fast, fit, athletic players. Five players over 25 in the squad. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the the one thing I will say in terms of you know, maybe maybe some good news if we're looking for some good news when we played against Nordseland during the friendlies that's a similar kind of team young, athletic fast and out of all the friendlies that we played like in Austria I thought that was the one where I thought we're going to struggle mm -hmm. 
like they're going to expose us because of those physical traits. But they didn't. I was pleasantly surprised but the first half in particular, how we handled that, like we looked really well organized and we dealt with those traits. So, you know, that's something positive for me. But, you know, what am I looking at as potential areas of weakness for us in that in that game? First thing is, Marshall mentioned the striker. He's very good in the air. And Eretos isn't that good in the air. Uh, and then, you know, Fryer is an unknown quality, unknown quantity for me. And it's, you know, it can't be a Retos doi partnership at the back. No. Physically, no. they will be exposed mm -hmm. against this team. Um, so that worries me uh, somewhat. You've got Ibora covering the holes. You know, his experience, I think, will play a role. And very good in, in the in this. He's very good in yeah. the air. Um, and then the wings, uh, they're, I think their most dangerous, well, one of their most dangerous players is uh, Mike Trezor, who plays mm -hmm. on the left. And, um, and Muniz, their right back, he likes to bump forward a lot. I worry more about our right side. <clears throat> uh, I think if, if Martinez is crazy enough to start BL on the right in this game, we're going to have a big problem. They're going to have a big problem. That I think, for me, it has to be Masuras. It has to be Masuras, um, Rodine, on the right. Anything else is going to be a big problem for us. We have to find a way to shut them down on that side. And I think that's going to be a key like, key aspect in the first game, in Karai Skaki. And I was also reading today that Martinez obviously has experience of playing these qualifying games. Like he did it with Granada. And in all the home away fixtures that he had, whether it was knockout in the later phases of the Europa League or whether it was in qualification, it was always the home game where he built the foundations for qualification. So that, that adds a little bit more pressure going into, into Thursday's game. But, but again, guys, like, like it or not, our path to the group stage is not littered with rose petals right if we get past genk we're likely to play against ajax like we're a pot four team yep. and we'll be pitted against the pot one team and the draws tomorrow by the way but yeah. but it's not is not an easy draw at all no one thing well, look one thing at a time Got to focus on what's in front of us. Let's, we'll, you know, deal with gank. And then if, if we get past that, then we think about how we approach the next thing. But it's um, not something I feel good about. Another thing, Costa, because um, you, you were bringing up some like weaknesses and strengths. So a weakness that I've seen, or at least, or at least I've seen where we've struggled so far in the friendlies are teams that are able to not just press us, but press us pretty high. We've seen that, and, may, and maybe that could have been just growing pains with the transition to Martinez's system, but those games we watched in the friendlies where we had any type of press against us, we looked a little bit more fragile. And Gank can press. I mean, I'm looking, I was looking at their pressing charts, and they, I mean, we're talking, they're averaging seven, seven passes allowed per defensive action. That is a pretty intense press. Anything under 10 is pretty high. You start getting into the, the under the eights, under sevens. And in the first half, they're averaging a press that is under six and a half passes allowed per defensive action. That is a very intense press. So that, that's just another thing. That's just another thing that I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit worried about. And in the last couple of years, especially towards the end of Mar of uh, Pedro Martins' tenure, the one thing, the, the one kind of like saving grace or one of the saving graces for us, especially when we weren't playing so well, was our, I don't want to say mastery, but in the offensive side of things, we were actually pretty good on set pieces. I don't know how we're going to be on set pieces this year. We weren't really good at them last year. I have a question for you. Sure. What is, what is their X goals against? Did you have a look at that? Because Who, that, gank? they are yeah, because they they seem super leaky at the back. They are leaky at the back because they're 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 let's just say they're uh 
uh, they're outperforming their XG against. Because if you look at the goals that they've suffered now in, in official matches, we'll say, right? Uh, Servette and and Upen or Upern, whatever, however you say their name. Uh, I'll give you the exact figure right now. Um, again, so their total XG against is under three. It's actually two point. No, it's right at about three. So it's right at about three, and they've conceded four goals. Versus XG four is eight and a half, and they've scored three goals. So they're they're underperforming in both facets. You know, they're they're leaking more goals than they should be, all things considered. More goals than you would expect, all things considered. And they're definitely not scoring as many goals as they should based on the opportunities that they're having. So that's where that's something where, you know, hey, this is what we need to look on. A lot of they are leaky in the back. They are leaky on the press. If you can press against them and get pressure forward, maybe that's something Diego Martinez will do. Uh, there are points to be had here. There are there, results. There, there is a result to be taken from this game. My, my whole thing is this is not going to be easy because this team, even though they're not getting results, they can they can make opportunities for themselves. They can threaten. And I, I don't want people expecting that we're getting past this and getting to the playoffs. and all of a sudden, you know, first leg comes up and we take two or three nothing in that first in that first match. That's that that's just my worry about the expectations of this game. And and then furthermore, if something like that does happen and we end up playing we end up playing awfully or awfully or we end up losing like that, all of a sudden this whole rebuild, this whole project becomes comes under great scrutiny. Yeah. And that's what I don't want to happen. I really don't want that to happen. I, 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 it's not that I want us to win and progress into the group stages more. I don't want us to lose and then lose the project. That's what I'm worried about. No one wants that. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know how else you guys feel about that, but that's like how I see... Um, that's how I see this. Like, I, I, not that I don't want us to progress because we'll cross that bridge. We'll cross that bridge. Yeah. We can't, like, I don't think there's any sense right now in talking about what if we lose and what does it mean. Right. I don't think now's the time to talk about that. We'll talk about that if and when. Hopefully not. Uh, I said it before. Even if we do get past Genk, it's going to be a hard game after. Whoever it is, it's a pot one team. Yeah. That's so true. look, uh, we're we're paying for what we did the last couple of seasons. Last season in particular, mm -hmm. we're paying for it now. We finished fourth in the league. Yep. We finished fourth in the league. That's why we're a pot four team going into this U, um, Europa League qualification. Yeah. So th th there's no way of getting around that, guys. It's I think that this is going to be... You know, Genk is not at their best. They are a team, however, that was fighting for the league. At the end of last season, in the 90th minute, the last fixture of the season, they were winning the title until, I think it was... Um, until uh, Toby, and to yeah, Toby uh, Aldeviro would hit that screamer from outside the box and Antwerp won the league in the 92nd minute. Stoppage time. But Genk were winning the league. So they're not... <laughs> they're not an easy team to no. face. Oh, again, I missed I'm, something. I, I... Costa, I missed something. I'm sorry. I thought this was a friendly, but this is an official match. They played... Their, their actual season opener was against RWD Molenbeek. Whoever that five is, nil. they won four. They won four nothing, and four? they had an XG of five, five point oh nine. <laughs> so Mullen, in the, Mullenbeck Jesus. is a newly promoted team. Jesus yeah. Christ! So they're so so. Think about that. Four games, <laughs> XG of thirteen, over thirteen and a half. Nuts, man.
nuts. Not a not a joke. Not a joke. Well, boys, we're we're an hour and a half in. Um, I don't know about you guys, but uh, I, I we've covered all the topics I had for us today. Is that did anybody have anything else they wanted to broach before we go ahead and start to close up? No, it's uh, not the countdown now, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. The that's time it. between the last friendly and the first European game is very long, very very yeah. long. Yeah, too long. I got something. Oh, go ahead, Kosha. So, uh, I will be in Athens for the game on on Thursday. Check out socials on Twitter, Instagram, etc. Um, normally, I will be outside the Taekwondo. Um, outside the stadium around 8 o'clock-ish but check out socials on the day anyone that's going to the stadium if you want to come say hello uh, be great to meet some of you in person so that's a good opportunity so looking forward to meet some of you hopefully on, on Thursday I've already received quite a lot of messages from people um, that are in Greece on holiday like me uh, people that have travelled in from Australia people that are in from North America other parts of Europe so it'll be really fun to to, to get to meet some of you outside the stadium on Thursday. There you have it. And I believe Gustav with a K is going to be there as well, correct? If he's recovered. Yeah, that's right. That's right. If he's recovered. I saw somebody wishing him well from, from COVID. Yeah, he's still recovering, uh, still tested positive. Uh, last we spoke to him as well earlier today. So hopefully he recovers and he's able to do it. Uh, and you know what this means, guys? If you're in the area, make sure you say hi to Costa because vlog coming the content is fantastic uh you guys love those vlogs so if you want to be in it say hi maybe he'll ask you some questions and you can be on the next one these things get they get picked up like crazy so check it out if you're there say hi to costa hang out we love seeing you guys when we're there on site it's always so much fun um thank you everyone for listening especially if you made it this far this is gate seven international by the fans for the fans Support us on Patreon because that is live. We went through all the tiers earlier. Uh, you can see it on patreon.com slash gate7international. The link is in our bios on socials. So check it out. Support us. Help us get to the next level and help us evolve to make the best content for you because that's what we are here for. We are here to be a voice for the fans and to create the biggest community that includes all fans of Olympiacos. It doesn't matter where you are. Subtitles, Greek, Spanish, French, we usually do for every pre-recorded video. And this will be available to sometime tomorrow as soon as the subtitles are generated. So check that out. And we will see you. Hopefully, we will have um, the pre-match with the Belgian Football Podcast. Uh, hopefully, that comes out early this week. But until then, we'll see you guys. Oh,